play a game? Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky and little rock, it's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for tuning in. And this week, I have a returning guest from really just two or three weeks ago, Adam Lawson, who turned out to be uh, not only doing cool stuff with his uh, The Kill Journal horror graphic novel, but is also involved with an upcoming new tabletop role-playing game called Asunder, and joining him on that journey or a couple of other people, not the least of which is Robert J. Schwab, who uh, should be no stranger to people who uh, have more than a casual acquaintance with tabletop role-playing games. So we're going to be talking today about this. It's about to go to Kickstarter on the 17th, November 17th, and today is the 12th. So this will release next week. By the time this podcast comes out, this Kickstarter will already be going or impending. Um, and and what little, I researched it some, but as often do I only research so much because I want to be surprised by what my guests tell me. Adam, real quick, do you want to give an update on the Kill Journal? Uh, so the Kill Journal has been a total success. We're funded. We're on our second 30 days of the campaign. It's been awesome. The support in making horror graphic novels is so fun. Um, one of the reasons why speaking Rob is here, why I was really intrigued when Brian Engard initially showed me Shadow of the Demon Lord, um, because I love dark gripping tales and uh, the Kill Journal is that, and it's been a great success. So thank you for having me on about that, Shane. It's doing great. But now we're just unlocking stretch goals and getting, uh, the mini stories added on. We've already broken the first one and we're about ready to hit the second one. And so it's been great. Yeah, very good. And if, uh, if people didn't hear, the show with Adam a couple weeks ago. One, go check it out. It's a good show. We talk not just about the graphic novel, but about our love of horror movies and who would win Jason versus Michael Myers and which version and all that. So we got nice and geeky on a, on a horror level. Adam is also was the, or is also, was also the producer on the tabletop uh, show that was so popular among uh, tabletop board game players. And he's also been involved with the uh, film industry, not the least of which uh, you were involved with Snakes on a Plane, but other things as well. So Adam is a very interesting person. So go listen to that podcast if you haven't already. And also we have Robert J. Schwab, who if you don't happen to know or if you don't know everything he's done, uh, he's been involved with multiple versions of the Dungeons and & Dragons. And I know the fourth and fifth edition, definitely. But were you involved with any other editions, Robert? I wrote quite a bit for a third edition. Did you? Okay. You have founded your own company, and, and you have a very popular gaming system called Shadow the Demon Lord, uh, which is what pre a lot of people know you for now. Uh, you've also worked uh, You worked for, with Numenera. You've worked with The Strange. Uh, I, I was looking. You, you've got like 200 credits to your name with gaming industry in some form or fashion, and also... Uh, You've got a novel under your belt, so you've been out there doing it. And you also, I've, I happen to be uh, pretty good friends with Russ Morrissey uh, with Ian World, Ian Publishing. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't even realize uh, I've got it sitting over here right on my shelf, uh, the the t Worlds of 2000 AD Judge Dredd role-playing game, which is just a beautiful book. So uh, do you want to, before we talk about Asunder, uh, Robert, uh, do you want to go, do you go by Robert or Rob? What's most comfortable uh, for you? We will go with Rob tonight. Okay, Friendly people, it's Rob. Okay, so Rob, do you want to get... Well, it's something else. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thank you for allowing me to sure. refer to you as Rob. So, what, uh, is there, are there any updates not related to Asunder that you would like to make sure to get out there? Uh, well, Asunder is, uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, in addition to Asunder's uh, ongoing development and uh, imminent arrival into the world of gaming, uh, I am busily working on Shadow of the Weird Wizard behind the scenes. Which mm. is a world that uses the Demon Lord engine, uh, explores a new magic system. Uh, it makes some tweaks to the core engine, but most importantly, it is family friendly. Whoa! Everybody, what? Everybody can play it. And Shadows of the Demon Lord is not not necessarily known for family friendly, so that's a pretty. The big Demon update. Lord is not. He doesn't like. He likes to eat families. The Demon yeah. Lord is friendly to family. Well, he is a Demon Lord after all. 
So right. you would expect a certain amount of demon lordness. So I love the name of it, the weird wizard. I know nothing about it other than what you've shared, but it evokes that sort of seventies cool Michael Moorcock kind of fantasy or Jack Vance or something. I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but it evokes well, that. Yeah, yeah. So I love that a lot. Um, also, okay. So I have a. Um, we talked about this a little bit before we start recording. I'm hoping my memory is right, and I'm not conflating something. Were you in Hot Springs for SpaCon a couple of years ago? Do you remember being? I there? was. Okay, yeah. so I have. Uh -oh. Do you recognize this? Oh yeah, I sure yeah. do. So what I'm holding for the for the listeners at home <laughs> is a custom made leather wristband that looks like something that Grognar the Barbarian would be wearing, and Robert was in, or Rob was in a panel at. SpaCon with Hot Springs, along with, I can't remember the guy's name. He was really cool. He was one of the main people for Pathfinder Stephen from Paizo. Who was that? Do you remember? Uh, SRM, Stephen Radley McFarland. Very nice guy. During the panel, you would randomly yell stuff out and toss these little leather wristbands into the crowd. <laughs> and, and this one, you had actually worn and you took it oh, off your God. wrist. And so not only do I have a Robert J. Schwab custom wristband, but it's got your sweat in it. Yeah. It was covered in sweat, but yes. So for the yeah. So for the duration in your honor, for the duration of this interview, I'm wearing my Grognard the Bar or yeah, Grog we'll call him Grognard the Barbarian wristband. So <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So there's one other person I want to make sure to bring up and then I'm gonna talk with uh, Rob a little bit. He's he's gotta leave earlier than um, Adam does, and we wanna respect his time. Who was the other? You've mentioned more than once with me. There's a there's a, another designer in the mix here that's been doing a lot of the design work based on the Shadows of the Demon Lord engine. So did you want to throw him some love real quick? It's Brian Engard. Yeah. Um, he worked on a game called Fate Core. Um, he's also created some of his own other original games. An amazing writer. And he's who turned me on to Rob's work. Um, or I should say not Rob's work, but Shadow of the Demon Lord. Right. Because that... And I remember when I read Shadow of the Demon Lord, um, Rob, it was like, I was like, ah, somebody met, finally made the role playing game I want to play. Right? You know, in, in a fantasy setting, because I'm kind of a World of Darkness fan, you know, and I always felt like, you know, between Pathfinder and D&D, &D, I was always such a little light, right? And I, uh, and I felt like, you know, that like when I read that book, I was like, and that system and the way it was designed, I was like, ooh. This is if Joe Abercrombie was writing, a, you know, a, the fantasy role playing game. This is something that was that took it to a, a place that's going to push boundaries, and you know, and and even you know, here's a funny thing in in the lore of Asunder, right? Rob is that the Gaia, who's like the the presence inside of the planet, she's starting to consume it, right? And the gods who are over this planet is she just is she just angry or is she hungry or why is Gaia doing been, this? She was imprisoned. Ah. Oh. Okay. And she's wanting to escape. And so when people die, she consumes their essence and gets stronger. Oh. And ultimately with the idea of jettisoning off the planet. But the gods left the planet in the big and early on. And when they did, they took all the metal to go fight a war, right? That's the myth left in the keeper's tome. The answer to the war that they're going to fight. And we're talking about a summer going, here to be very clear. Yes. Not shadows. Okay. Yes. And in the myth of it, well, who they're going to go fight is the demon Lord, hmm. right? That's the, so there's a the, so there's the, a direct connection there. Yeah, there's certainly a connection. It's mentioned in the title of the game, you know, in the beginning of the game. Hey, that we we um, the, the system, you know, uses a lot of what was created there. Obviously, we've modified it to our world and our setting, um, and also to the fact that we have chaos and we have living weapons and things that aren't present in uh, Shadows of the Demon Lord, the Shadow of the Demon Lord. But the one thing that I think that we inherited the, the very best are two things. I would say is the path system which is so much more fun than classes and boons and banes. Well, tell us um, a little bit about that then. Rob, uh, Rob, tell us a little bit about the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob, tell, you, yeah. you're the creator of the path. So, so you yeah, tell, tell us. A couple of things when I was working on uh, with Demon Lord's uh, design goal was to try to uh, step out of the way, play things they want to play. And to facilitate that end, I divided up character progression into uh, three or four meaningful chunks. So character creation starts off with one major big choice with a few smaller things you'll be doing, what you'll be doing. And as you play through the campaign, every time your group uh, finishes an adventure, your group gains a level. 
and then you make another interesting choice. And that choice happens at level one, level three, and level seven. And so what happens is that you start off small. So you start off with a novice path. So you'd be in your very first starting adventure, you might just be some dirt farmer or a grave digger or whatever. But you manage to kill a zombie and hand-to-hand combat, and you feel pretty badass. And so you become a warrior as your first choice as your novice path. Now, uh, two levels later, you are get you get to make another choice about uh, your character and how your character develops. And you could choose to do something where I want to build on with the ideas that I started with this first guy. So maybe I'm going to choose a path that's going to be more about hunting undead. Or maybe something happened in the campaign so far where you found this bizarre screwed up tome of darkness that's wrapped in zebra skin but held together in chains and tongues. And it's it's amazing how often in an adventure you find a tome of darkness that's held together by uh, zebra, zebra skins, skins and, and chains and tongues. It's, it's right. practically a trope these it's days. everywhere. <laughs> so you manage to crack open this book and you're looking inside and you get all the magic goodness inside and you realize, I'm going to pursue necromancy. Okay. And so you're now starting to raise dead. And so your third path choice is your master path. And the master path allows you to take another step on the road to your character development. So what do, what happens is that you could have, and these are equally valid choices, you could go like, you know, warrior fighter, uh, you know, weapon master and be and have a lot of fun. Or you could do warrior, ne- uh, warrior wizard necromancer or something along those lines and also have a lot of fun. Uh, and be able to have and have your character choices, your mechanics reflect the things that have happened in the story. And so that was kind of the that's the the goal, and actually the product of what the past system does. So it does and it's it. really cool. It's really cool because like Rob, what's happened in my home game of a center? Somebody started out as a vanguard, and in our world, that's like a leader in military situations, and so they have all these powers to help assist people. And then along the way, when they were leading under pressure, they got addicted to demon blood. Nice. It became this addiction that they were hiding, right? Uh, again, another and hazard then, of adventuring is getting addic- addicted to demon blood. <laughs> to demon blood. <laughs> another f- famous problem. <laughs> and so then as a result, at, at their expert path, they chose a ravager, which are people who've like been able to like channel this addiction to give them like crazy raging power. So it went from like this leader in combat to like he's well, gone the opposite direction, right? And so the story shaped his powers versus – um, like you're saying, a traditional system where the class where you just level up in those abilities. And I, I think that was, I think that's such a fun way to experience uh, a fantasy RPG. Yeah, there, there, from the design side, there's always a tension between giving too much choice and too little choice. And right. I think that for novice players, having very little choice is a good way to go because they're going to, that gives them the opportunity to master what they're doing over time. I mean, I think back to when I was playing D and D when I was, a youngster, uh, you just play a fighter and nothing, you get nothing except you're more accurate and more hit points and maybe better gear, but the better gear doesn't happen by dint of your advancement. It just happens because you're able to kill things and you might get extra attacks if you live long enough. So, uh, in a class type system or any system that structures your progression in that way, you know, in D and D and various editions of it have offered players the ability to customize their character by, uh, adopting uh, micro systems like feats or powers or whatever else. Uh, fifth edition with that game, we decided to take a different direction where we gave the subclasses. And so your character, you're making one big choice about your class and you make a second choice and then you're pretty much done uh, because demon Lord and demon Lord games tend to be uh, shorter. So like 10 sessions long for a campaign or, or whatever uh, you can give three meaningful choices that kind of also highlight as uh, the risk that goes up. And then also you're delivering all these nice, juicy, chunky bits of tech uh, wrapped in a story uh, container, which I think is really important. Nice. So uh, I want to follow up on every, what you just said with, uh, with a couple of things. One, I, I've been on record multiple times saying, but anytime I have a chance to say to somebody who is involved with fifth edition, I like to say it to them. Fifth edition is an, a really good version of D and sure. I think that there was a lot of really good design choices made sure. and, and it's popularity. Totally. Yeah. It's popularity is not just because of critical role. Okay. I mean, critical role didn't hurt and it helps a lot, but it's also a really good system uh, for new players to play. In my opinion, it, it, it's, it's, it's not rules light. 
and it still feels crunchy, but it, it dumped some crunch, but while also giving some freedom of choice and, 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 you know, that sort of thing and a lot of character options and all that. But the main thing I wanted to ask about, specifically on uh, Shadows of a Demon Lord and now Asunder, I'm curious, what was the, was there an intentional choice or did it just kind of happen to work out that campaigns tend to be shorter? You mentioned something about approximately 15 sessions. Does, does Asunder go beyond level 10? It does not go beyond level 10, Rob. We kept it exactly in your system. Okay. And I think that like, and I, and I appreciate that because, and I also, I think what's nice about it, because the way you kind of level up, you know, in shadows as well as asunder, right. Is that you, the keeper essentially says our world is a keeper, right. As the game master it says you go up a level. So sometimes you can have like two or three sessions take that happen in one night, if you will, of story, right. you know? And so maybe you don't level up in those three sessions, uh, and you can kind of base it on where your group is at. So, uh, but I think like, I, I, that's what I feel though, Rob, like the amount of time that I've taken a character to, you know, 15th level and D and D is, uh, is, is zero. Right. And naturally. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, with, with demon, like, demon Lord's level progression and kind of capping it at 10 certainly came from, uh, meetings I was involved in during the development of fifth edition, uh, where we were gauging, we're just gathering data from, from the audience about, how long uh, gaming, how long campaigns last typically, how long gaming groups stick together. And, uh, you know, the D and D is always wrestled with the promise of 20 to 36 levels of gameplay. Uh, if you remember if in second edition in the high level options, they take the game and they cap it at 36. And I mean, when I, I ran a five year campaign in second edition and we capped out at around 13th level, mm-hmm. 13th level after you know, five years. So thinking about that, um, and the uh, fact that groups tend to fall apart after two months, it became. It, it, <laughs> really, well, honestly, all joking aside, is that a stat? Like, or are you just? I mean, is was, that a snarky stat or a real stat? That, that's a, that was a stat. That was a stat. That two months. So two months. it's like it's like new business, new small businesses. The majority fail, but then the others keep going. Like eighty percent or something of new business, small businesses fail within five years or something like that. I mean, think about it though. It's like you you're, yeah. you you get you get a new game. You're excited. Yeah. You get everybody together, and you can get everybody together for the first couple of weeks, and then you start dropping players off. Right. And, and then after the second month, your game whole your whole game falls apart. Wow. Uh, so knowing that what reality is like and the the uh, embarrassment of riches. That is the options for entertainment out there. I wanted to build a game that you could get the full play experience in the time that you have that most people have allotted to it. So if you can do eight game sessions over two months, you can go the extra two and finish out a campaign of Demon. Wow, oh, that's that's cool. So you could actually experience the full. full and I, I don't even know if you'd consider it a power curve or not, but you can uh, narrative story wise and to see where your character can go, you can experience let's i'm just going to throw out a number six months or less you know sure. four months three months something like that. some people i know some groups meet once a month so sure you get a bunch of adults especially you got jobs marriages kids together you know and all that stuff or whatever it's hard to it can be hard to get an ongoing group going so uh i, I think the way you've tackled it with shadows of the demon lord and now asunder will benefit from that is is a really great way of doing it you know you're not committing to five years of your life to see a story or a character all the way through. The other thing about the, at least at Demon Lord, uh, there's no expectation that uh, the next adventure you play through is going to happen the next day or the week after. Uh, between adventures, you could have six months to a year. And the story you're telling, these are the highest water moments of your character's life. Right. It's, and with making every adventure... Demon Lord adventures are typically playable in a single session of two to four hours on purpose so that you also eliminate the problem of yeah. missing players next time you play. I'm, I'm nodding yeah. a lot while you're talking because, yeah, that's but, yeah, it's hard to do. Rob, I think also one thing that we also chose with Asunder, because I think you were kind of tipped off in Shadow of the Demon Lord, is all of our modules and all of our prompting for keepers is to start each session in the middle of the action. Yeah. So instead of start, yeah. So so we like we would start a, 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 an adventure and it's like, all right, so and so, um, <clears throat> a, a grave robber has a knife to your throat and he wants the gem you, you stole from him 
last week. And the adventure starts there instead of, well, we're at the pub for a while and then we get into a bar fight and yeah. then somebody needs to hire some mercenaries. Nothing wrong with that. But once again, I think of the interest of excitement. And then we, we added this element uh, to Ascender. Um, or I, sh- I shouldn't say that it's, a, it's not so much a rule as a, as a keeper's prompt is to use a six sided dice whenever there's a time crunch. And let's say <clears throat> uh, you come to the scene of a crime and there's a murder in the back alley and you hear some yelling down the street and the militia has been called and the keeper rolls a six out of dice and it comes up the number three and the keeper holds that number up and sets it in front of him and says, great, you guys have three choices before the militia shows up, you know, or three rounds of action, right. To help right. keep, keep like this, yeah. keep this sense of energy about it. So that then like by the end of like, you're saying a two to four hour session, you've got the high, the highlights, right. right. Um, I like it, and I think I think that you uh, you know really inspired that when you in your writing when you were saying, "Hey, let's make these ca- campaigns and these adventure models meant to be actually played through." Right. Um, um, so, and I think that um, with small prompts and a, and a small um, push if from the storytellers and players to think that way, it really changes the campaign. Um, mm-hmm. There's another element. Um, in um, Asunder that's also in the Shadows that was so great, it's called Fatal Flaws, right? And what happens is when a character's Fatal Flaw gets triggered, let's say I can't stand authority, and Shane, you're the law, and you want answers from me. I am the so law! Even, and, 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 even, and, I, and I don't want to give you those answers, even though I'm not necessarily in trouble yet. So we get into an argument about it, and the Keeper says, your Fatal Flaw has been triggered. You've got to escalate the stakes. So you can choose to say, no, I'm not going to, and that's no fun for anyone. Or you can say, I'm going to do it. And by doing so, you get a secret point by giving in to your fatal flaw. Okay, so you, so don't, an get, argument, you don't get penalized, but you get rewarded. You get right? rewarded. Okay, so it's not so like it's you a get way, the DM or the GM threat or the keeper threat or something. Right, right. But it's a way to like prod players to escalate the stakes in a moment. Hey, your fatal flaw has been triggered. You have a thirst for violence. It's being triggered. And then it gives it helps prompt the keeper to help prompt players to act on their character versus to act on maybe the most efficient right. thing to do. Right, role play. Don't you know? Set back and treat it like you have all the time in the world, and you can figure out the best method. And yep. I'm not saying that's meta gaming, but it it is. You know, it's better if you get into your character. That's what you're there for, right? It's role playing. R O L E. So. Well, that's what, so what uh, I'm hearing a lot of things why Asunder and what we'll do, uh, we'll get more into the setting and the world of Asunder. Sure, sure. Uh, I got to so, probably throw my flag anyway. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. OK. Well, hey, man, thanks so much for joining. For yeah, it's, it's, it's a yeah. pleasure. A pleasure having you. Thanks again for the for the wristband. No, Rob, it's good to chat. I, I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see the product. I'm very excited. OK, so, be good. Thanks, man. Thanks for joining. Right, take care. Yeah. yeah. All right, that makes a good point to take a quick pause and do some show notes, and we will be back with Adam Lawson and our discussion about Asunder RPG and RPGs in general here in a moment. You can always contact me on Twitter at ShanePlays, that's S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S, or you can email me at Shane at ShanePlays.com. Speaking of ShanePlays.com, S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S.com, you can always find notes and links and etc. for every podcast right there on the blog. Uh, you know, so if you want to know more about the topic or guest on any particular episode, or if, you know, I mention a link and you're like, "Oh, I want to make sure to get that," just go to shameplays.com and you'll find it. Uh, last week's show is out there. It's on the blog and in the Podosphere. It's all over the place. Um, it's you know all the different places that we publish it. And that was episode 232, Tecamel, The Empire of the Petal Throne, and Professor M.A.R. Barker with Robert Alberti. It was a great show. Tecamel not only has an incredibly rich history and a fascinating creator, but was the first published RPG setting in 1975. I mentioned a second ago that the podcast goes out in different places. It goes out on the blog at shameplays.com. 
on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, YouTube, and more. And last but never least, Shane Plays is carried on Krypton Radio. Krypton Radio is sci-fi for your Wi-Fi. KryptonRadio.com. Now, if you would like to support the show, we do have a Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash shameplays. You can support for as little as a dollar an episode. Another way you can support the show is on Twitter and on the, fa- the Shame Plays Facebook page. I often put out affiliate links from Humble Bundle and occasionally others where you can get great deals on books, comic books, games, software, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, And if you use my affiliate link, it puts just a little bit of money in my pocket, and I always appreciate that. So always push it out, like I said, on the Shame Place Facebook page and on Twitter. As I often mention, I have two Twitter accounts. Shame Plays, S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S, is my main Twitter account where I'm just very chatty and talk about anything and everything. If you just want the meat and potatoes, follow Shane Plays PR, S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S, PR. That's basically, I just give updates on the show, select news items, and affiliate links and that sort of thing. Last, but never, ever, ever, ever least, I want to give a shout out to advertising partner Kursova Magazine, C-I-R-S-O-V-A, Kursova Magazine. It's the magazine of thrilling adventure and daring suspense. Uh, It's great. If you love science fiction, fantasy, pulp fiction, that sort of thing, Kursova is carrying the torch. Excellent magazine. Definitely check it out. I'm glad to have them as an advertising partner. All right, that's it for the show notes. Thanks so much for listening. So, Shadow of the Demon Lord is the engine, the system that Asunder is using. That's right. Up to and including to, narrative-wise, Gaia, or, you know, or, or Gaia, an in-character or an in-universe Asunder being could potentially challenge the Demon Lord. So there, there's a pretty strong connection there. Yeah. Uh, if I, Yeah, okay. So... Uh, and we and we've talked about a lot about why Shadows of the Demon Lord is a good fit for Asunder as as an independent. And one thing I want to make it, Asunder is an independent role playing game. It's not a supplement for Shadows of the Demon Lord. It's you 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 you, you get Asunder, you get a complete game. Um, what else would you say mechanics and system wise? Is is like unique for a Sunder because what I'm hearing, yeah, from you is like so you couldn't, yeah. So the unique aspects of a chain are, um, for example, in a Sunder, there's no magic, there is chaos, right? And only people from the mainland can tie can tie into it. And essentially, chaos was what the gods used to create things, but it's not meant for humans. It's wildly out of control to use it. You get this acquire this thing called discord. Right, and when you take on Discord, it starts to do things for you. It starts to alter your appearance. It can you can blow up. Um, it starts to do damage to you. And when you use Dis uh, Chaos, you become a, it, it's addictive, and you want to push it. Um, and so it can do more damage to you. So Discord is a new characteristic that only exists in Asunder. And another thing called Strain, which happens because in Asunder, there's all kinds of symbiotic and living weapons made from plants, insects, and crustaceans. Right, depending on what island you're from and where your essence gives you bonding, and so when you take a, a you know back, you can have an artillery cannon that's a living plant that attaches to your back, you know, cuts into your skin and it grows on your arm and it shoots these incredible thorn blasts. It's amazing, but that thing is feasting on you a bit to stay alive. And so then you take on this thing. And so that strain. That strain that affects that. And there are other things that can cause strain as well too. Um, and so these two um, things are different. And then we also use essence, um, which isn't used in uh, Shadows of the Demon Lord. Because Shadows of the Demon Lord uses uh, a little bit more traditional magic than Asunder. Where in Asunder, what's happened is, is when humans are created, their essence, this like divine spark, and then bonded with different parts of the world – and gave them control over it. And so the world, that's called the Sunder because it's broken into pieces, was broken when the when the gods left. And so well, now when you say it was broken into pieces, do you mean literally like individual pieces of the planet are 
independent, but next to each other? Or like, what do you mean by broken? Like there was one big, like imagine Pangea theory, right? right. One big landmass and then it was broken apart. You know, some islands okay. even went into the sky. And so this essence bond gives people, you know, power over gravity, the power to reshape plants or insects or to take on the aspects of beasts or to meddle with chaos. And so this essence is people's, um, uh, so to speak, their innate power. And also in Asunder, there's only humans. There's no dwarfs and elves and et cetera. Um, it's your essence that separates you and your island of origin. Um, so it's not Tolkien high fantasy. No, it's, it's no. fantasy, but it's not it's not Tolkien or D or what people think of as traditional D and D fantasy. That's correct. Um, so what is it? What challenges do like what what are the hooks for adventure in Asunder? Uh, other than the fact that you know Gaia at the center of the planet is trying to break free. Like what are what are you know what's a typical you know, adventure in Asunder. Yeah, so in Asunder, at the core of Asunder, players are playing seekers, right? And they've been called to adventure instead of necessarily for fame or fortune, though that could be tied into it too, is because they've seen the signs that the end is coming. And mm -hmm. other people around them don't believe, but seekers have seen it. And in some way, they've all had sort of a, um, um, a, a holy vision, if you will, in some way, whether they've seen the dead rise up because um, in Asunder, the dead rise, but it's through uh, fungi infecting them, right? And they come – or they've seen the plagues in New Gaia or they've met a demon or they some way they have seen, oh, wait, the end is coming. And so they're seeking answers to either maybe stop it, maybe to end up on top when it falls or whatever they choose. So – the initial path. But they know they know something's coming. They know something is coming, and they are together because they're seeking an answer. And so, the way the characters work is at each um, uh, at each time you go up a level or change a path, you start your question or what you're seeking modifies. Right at first, you might seek an answer to what happened to your brother. Why did he disappear in the night? Right, you think that's tied into the end of the world, and then it develops, and that you realize, oh. Your brother was taken by this cult. And so now what you're seeking is the end of the cult because you believe they're bringing it on. Um, and so that's how – that's kind of the core engine is that you're seekers of the answers to this mysterious world um, and, you know, and, and, to, and to save it. So that's – so maybe a typical adventure um, might be something like this um, in what we're playing on with Amy and Satine. You know, they're looking for Gaia's seed, which is this – plant that can grow a new tree of knowledge um, or I should say a new great tree that the people in New Gaia have and they believe that this can maybe help cure the world right so they are seeking this item um, but things get nefarious in Asunder right and although it's not as dark in appearance as um, as Shadows of the Demon Lord which is awesome and amazing because we're in a verdant world right um but it is dark and brutal. super verdant, like lethally verdant. In Bingo. Some ways. That's yeah. exactly what yeah. it is. It's it's become dark and heavy because the world is tougher than you. The the, the monsters are stronger. You have to be. Um, the threats are overwhelming, and so um, so that's so an adventure might be something like that, or it could be in a home game. Somebody's was from Sky City. Their family was disgraced. Uh, people were killed. And um, they're seeking revenge, right? Could be the impetus of it as one of the characters. Maybe another character ha has – because uh, Asunder keeps the memories. Anything that's happened in Asunder is stored in the earth. And there is a path hmm. called Wanderers who can find those memories. And so one of the characters might have found a memory of something that they're seeking an answer for. Right there, there's a. They see a memory of this monstrous door in the earth. Well, what is that door, and what does it lead to? Maybe that's the cure. It remind, I, and I, I don't think that it's it's a direct comparison. But I was just. It made me think of that tree in Avatar, where all of the 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 villagers kind of put their memories in the tree and all that. So, um, yeah, it sounds like a really interesting world, where it, it's still. There's still basically 
like automatic weapons and so, but it's but it's plant based. It's all this crazy. Yeah, I mean, right. well, it's not, it's not, like it's not, it's not yeah. automatic weapons in the sense of like you would think of like a yeah. machine gun, but that you can exactly. have like there are mech right. suits in this world, but they're living. And it's all organic, organic yeah. suits. Yeah, and yeah, it's almost like if uh, if everybody like. It, 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 there for a while in DC Comics, Swamp Thing could do all kinds of crazy stuff with the planet. That's a good way. It to almost sound, sounds a little bit, a little bit like that. So what? What? Let me ask you this. And I and I know that you you shared in our previous discussion that you're one of the people out there, which I salute this approach. That went, you know what? Coronavirus is slowing everything down. I'm not just going to sit around and, you know, watch TV or whatever. And if people want to sit around and watch TV, go for it. But there's there's some people like, I'm going to use this time to work on stuff I've been wanting to get to. And and so you started working on, like, graphic novels and, and some other ideas. Uh, and, and obviously, tabletop role-playing games was an interest of yours. Yep. So what is your history with tabletop role-playing games and why Asunder? So uh, Asunder, you know, started about... I guess now it's over six years ago. Um, and my history with them is as it was my first love, right? It was Dungeons and Dragons when I was young. Was it? Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and I sort of grew from Dungeons and Dragons to World of Darkness. And I still play in a D&D group, but we play 5e that I love. Um, and um, it's great. Yuri Lowenthal and David Nett and a whole bunch of really cool folks play with me. Um, and it's, it's really great. Um, but so I, I, it was just like, it was what I would say, I owe all of my writing career in television to. It's what I would say when I'm on set directing TV or film, I'm just doing what I did in my bedroom in the sixth grade. Um, hmm. and so it is, so it's at the core of me for sure. It's at the core of what I love, you know, uh, this ability to create these amazing characters and worlds and then to experience them. And with Asunder, I wanted to do it at the highest level I could, right? So there's two hardcover source books with super high-end art that cost a fortune, and it built out these two beautiful books. And art, had, let me, let me, I have to point out, art costs a lot. That's right. <laughs> if you, people want to get into role-playing game development and, and publishing, art costs a lot. If you want good art, you're going to pay for it. Yeah, I mean, we commissioned over, uh, you know, 100, over 160 images, right? Plus, we had minis built, custom dice, a novel written. Um, and we crafted something that, because I feel like, you know, same thing with the graphic novel. It's like, it might be my first, but for an audience member, it might be their 10th. And so it needs to feel like what they could get anywhere else. And, and it's, you know, and even better. So that's why I brought, went to Rob, went to Brian Engard. You know, I crafted this world and then I brought up upon their expertise to make it into something that's truly solid and is, has no amateur mistakes, right? It's got some of the, the, the finest minds in role-playing games behind it. Um, and then also my passion for it and then this unique world. And then all of the bells and whistles to make it feel exciting when you hold it in your hands. Right, so you're one to put out a like a really polished it it, you know, it is a really role polished role thing because it, it's done so did you the game is all done right the game's all done the minis are done the dice are all done in their digital states right now it's getting them right yeah it's ready to you know what you know what you need to go into your kickstarter with yeah, yeah absolutely right. it's it's are, are now is it going to be kickstarter or indigo it's going to be kickstarter Which one's it yeah be? yeah okay all right so it's going to be on kickstarter the show notes for this episode will either launch with the Kickstarter link or I'll update it as soon as it's live. Do you have a pre-register? Yeah, Kickstarter there's a pre-launch page. You okay. can jump on in. And if you back it day one, I have a three campaign module um, that you get for free in, in PDF form. You get that. Um, there's also a quick start guide that's available now. So people can d- dive in and even start building a character today if they want. So you um, started, you said earlier that you were, you started working on a sender about six years ago. Uh, did I hear that? Right, about six years ago, you started developing the setting. The That's world. right. That's right. So, with my childhood friend Landon Tom, who I used to play with, you know, he and I met at Starbucks every uh, every other morning for a few months to bang out this world that we've always been kind of pondering, and that's what it, and that's what it became. And so, um, it was something that I crafted and then built the right team. And you know, I had some help along the way from Hal Mangold and Chris Premis 
um, who were wonderful to kind of point me in the right direction. And then Brian Engard, I can't say enough about him. You know, his, right. his fingerprints are on every page. You were talking with Brian, and Brian's the one that turns you on to Shadows of the Demon Lord, at, like saying this might be a good fit for Asunder? Or That's right, because that, I, okay, I, I yeah. had initially come to Brian with the idea of crafting a new system altogether. Um, and I had this thought for a game system um, with this dice pushing effect. And he said, Adam, I think that's a, maybe too ambitious of an undertaking. Um, I, I, based on what you described to me, I think you should look at this. And I looked at shadows and then I called Rob and we, you know, worked out to use the system. And oh, as soon as I read Rob's system, I was like, ah, that's what we should do. And he's just, had, so is it? No, it just has all the benefit of a truly play tested worked through system. So, so Rob, so like Brian has been doing, and your team have been doing a lot of the development and, and adapting Shadow of the Demon Lord to Asunder, uh, which has a lot of similarities. But as you mentioned earlier, you know, there's a few differences. What and uh, Rob has just been really supportive in. Yeah, so here's how you can use my system. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we were able to license his system from him. Um, and then it was very supportive, particularly with Brian, he and Brian, you know, and then Brian wrote all the words on the pages that you see. Um, so I essentially built like a 40 page, 50 page document initially that was the world and all the details of how the islands and how the, all the things would function. And then Brian took that and Rob's game and crafted out these two source books worth of material, which we did over the course of about, you know, a year and a half or two years. Um, oh, so this has really been, this is okay. Yeah. Uh, Wow. This, yeah. So this is, yeah. This is not only did you start concepting six years ago, but the actual nuts and bolts have been. Yeah, that's what you know, I. When I say it's yeah. done, I mean the book is is written. You can right. you can like it is. You can play it now um, from just right. the book. Yeah, and it's been through play testing nice. groups, um, and it's been a whole through a series of things. Yeah. Well, the, okay. So that's a that's a really interesting point that I'd like to explore with you. Up until you made Asunder. You and I were basically the same. Like, I played a lot of role-playing games, and I have a lot of ideas for role-playing games. And I think I know how it would go if I tried to make a role-playing game. But now that you've made one, how similar was it to the experience you were expecting? Well, I think that it was it was what I expected it to be, the journey, right? Having taken many creative endeavors. Um, uh-huh. And that is that there are lots of twists and turns, upsets and surprises and excitement along the way. Um, And then it really requires a persistence of vision over a long period of time. It, you know, I've pushed it up the hill myself for years. You know what I mean? And sometimes it sat and sometimes it's sat with certain, you know, on layout or other things took, you know, three or four more months or six more months than you were hoping. And, you know, it's all these things. It's taken so much effort to push it up the hill. Um, and that's the thing uh, that I am always certain of is that it will require endless persistence. So, um, so that that matched because you've done a lot of producing yeah. stuff in your yeah, life. Yeah, I've directed so. and produced a, you know well over a hundred episodes of TV and over twenty movies, and it takes persistence of vision, right? Right. It takes persistence. So what what changed? Assuming I'm assuming that some things changed during play testing or as you were collaborating with others and you got different people's perspective. Uh, what changed in Asunder that might have surprised you? Or were there were there any things going in you're like, this is a hill I will die on, we can't change this, and then maybe you ended up changing it after other people, you know, collaborated with you? Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm trying to think here, what was the one like the things, I guess, you know, at first I just had like, oh, I'm going to die on this new system. And then I realized that was a mistake. Um, and that was an idiot mistake. Uh, and I'm glad I got rid of that early on. And, and Brian really saw me through that. Um, I would say like a few of the things is I, I, I wanted the game to feel raw and aggressive and, um, and it to feel a little bit no holds barred. And not no holds barred in the sense that your characters had tons of power. But it was no hold bar to the risks and the stakes were high. Um, and I wanted it to feel not like Dungeons and Dragons. Not that I don't love it, but I can't be them. I, you know, you can't do better than them at what they do, right? 
Right. D and D is what it is. I mean, yeah, you, you, know, you they, can't. They they have that. They they own that particular space the way that George Lucas owned Laser Sword. That's I mean, it's just. It's boom. Don't mess with it. Don't try to reinvent it. They own it. And then Paizo with Pathfinder. I mean, they just own that territory. And they own that territory. And I just – and so I needed to have something that looked different. The art was different. It felt different. It felt more Conan. It felt more raw because I couldn't – I can't do what they can do. I don't have the resources or a 70-year legacy. So uh, so that's why a lot of choices I made was to help make it feel different and look different so that – if you're a fan of D&D, which I am, this is this is still exciting for you. So was it – how does it feel – and I'm guessing it's similar to seeing something you've written acted out or something. But how does it feel to watch people play your game? I mean, I mean are you like, oh, they're playing it exactly like I expected or is it, is it a pleasing feeling? What does that feel like? I mean, it's pretty awesome. I mean, Amy Vorpal is the keeper um, on on the show where it's being played right now. And I love Amy. She was – I directed her in Sagas of Sundry. She was there for season one with me and I – we just knew we were meant to work together. Um, and so um, – and she is a, you know, a very aggressive storyteller and she pushes things to the limit. And I selected a cast that was going to go there. And – but – when I see a plate, it's like you have that I belief in your head and then you give it to someone else and you see what they do with it. And what's cool is she does it better than I do it, right? She does it her own way, but in the same world, right? Because it's, you know, she's telling the story and like with anything, like nobody plays D&D exactly the same, right? And, and it's so cool to see that like she got the gist of it. She gets the understanding of it. The players get what the world's about. They get the feeling and that's that's a, a an amazing thing when you say, "Hey guys, here's what I've created," and they go, "Yeah, I got it. I know it." It's like I, I remember I've had this feeling a few times with with the eighth and with my TV shows where I'll see somebody. I did this with Escape the Night. Kids did a play and acted out episodes of the TV show. And you know, you make a TV show and you think right. people like it. You hope they like it, but then when you see somebody take it and make it their own. Then you know they loved it, and that's the, for me the most profound feeling of all. So when I see Amy and I see these players play it, and I see them connect with the world, the same thing at the home game and the other play testers, you're humbled. I have a friend in Finland who and I, and who did a whole round of notes on it with his group, right? So they're not Americans. They, you know, they have a different point of view, a different world, right? Um, and. And to see what came back from them and to see that they got this and understood this thing and liked this part of it. And I was like, it, it's really about as satisfying as it gets. That leads me kind of into my next question, people making it their own and loving it. And if this isn't something that you want to talk about, that's fine. But do you, are, like when you approach Asunder with as much world building as you put into it and love as you put into it, are you like – Man, this is I, all I want here is a tabletop RPG. Or are you thinking about other like books, TV, you know, or are you just like, you know what? This is my love letter to RPGs and that's all I really care about here. Well, I think with, with anything, it's exciting to see it become other things, to become games, to become other things because it only helps bring the magic to more people. Um, I remember I was having this conversation with Patrick Rothfuss um, you know, they, they were making an offer on the name of the wind from Lionsgate. And he and I were talking right before we did uh, the episode of Tabletop. And he said, Adam, I'm worried, you know, I get to give this out. And, um, and you know, what happens if it goes wrong, you know? And because I, I talked to him about how I found the book and then I gave it to my in-laws and then they all read it. And people who'd never read a fantasy novel had read it. And, um, <clears throat> and I said, as long as there's more Kavothi, uh, I'll take it anyway. I can get it, you know? Right. And I think the same thing is true here with Asunder. Um, as long as I can see it in other places and see more people playing it, it and, and interacting with it and talking about it, it's all worth it. Uh, I don't think I've set out saying, oh, I can't wait for this to be a TV show. I set out to say, I can't wait for people to play this on Friday night. Um, that's what's in my heart, right? To do what it did, what role playing games did for me and still do. That's what I would really like. Okay, that's cool. I did, like I the the genesis of that question, just so you know, 
like I know a local comic book company would, that is really putting a lot of resources into making comic books. Uh, but the closer I got to them, they shared, this is really about IP generation. The comic books are just a means to an end. Uh, but the, but the passion that I hear in your heart for, uh, for the role-playing games and D and D and all that, you know, led me to think that you might be like, yeah, whatever this is, you know, if it went somewhere cool, but my, you know, my first priority is simply the, the tabletop role-playing game experience. So, uh, I want to ask a couple of other questions and then we've got to, sadly, the time always goes so quickly on, uh, how would you describe, uh, we've described a little bit about why people would adventure in Asunder and the kinds of adventures and the overall meta story that's going on underneath all the world building. What, how would you, de- would you describe it as dark fantasy? Would you describe it? You know, yeah. you mentioned Conan, uh, like, you know, Pulp Fiction. I mean, what, yeah, how would you describe? Yeah, it's a dark fantasy. It's a dark fantasy with real, with real stakes and real complications and things hurt and bleed. And it's sexy and more mature in its nature. So I would call it definitely dark fantasy. So uh, on a scale of one to ten, how crunchy is it? Is it the equal equal crunchiness to Shadow of the Demon Lord? Yeah, I would say it's on the same exact yeah. page. I mean, if you were to say Dread is a one, right? Uh, right. And if I were to say, you know, ten is Twilight Imperium, um, you know, or <laughs> if I were to say, is it ten? Let's call ten GURPS. GURPS, yeah. Ten, yeah. ten is GURPS, and right? And one is, which I love GURPS, by the way. Yeah, but call GURPS a ten. Yeah. I, I'd probably say this more like somewhere in the neighborhood of like a five to seven. Maybe seven at tops, depending on which pass you choose, but somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, and there's definitely narrative stakes. There's combat, yep. sounds like, all the yep. all the good stuff there. So, yep. all right. Well, let's let's finish off on the Kickstarter. What can you share about what people will find at the Kickstarter? So the Kickstarter has three tiers. The first is the digital tier. You get two source books and the novel. So we have the Keeper's Guide and the uh, sorry, the Seeker's Guide and the Keeper's Tome, and then we have a novel called The Gathering of Chaos. So the digital path gets you all three of those. Then there is the Seeker's Path, and that gets you the hardcover of the Seeker's Guide and the print version of the novel, plus the digital versions. And then we have the Keeper's Path, which gets you two source books. It gives you custom dice. It gives you a Keeper's screen um, and any uh, the novel and any unlocked stretch goals. And the stretch goals we're unlocking are minis. So we have nine potential to unlock, um, six what I would say, seeker characters, and then three monsters, uh, a naga, a demon, and a devourer. And so um, if you pick the final tier, you get you get the, however many minis we unlock, you get them. You get a set of those. Um, the minis will be available as an add-on afterwards in backer kit, wherever we got to. Um, and if you back day one, there's a three-episode campaign, uh, three episode campaign module um, that you get for free. Um, if you miss day one on that, then you can buy it uh, as an add-on um, later as well. But that's what the campaign is. They're beautiful, glossy, hardbound books at the same quality level as a Dungeons & Dragons player's handbook with art on the same level, though I would say sexier and more dynamic and images with characters and places you've never seen. There are no people in bright, shiny armor. There are people with living cannons. Uh, there is, there are seafarers who have, in place of a kneecap, they have a mouth and an extra limb. Um, there are skimmers who can leap, you know, hundreds of feet, and they have these like spore packs on their back that let them sort of jettison places. So there are people in places you've never seen, and at, at the most dynamic. Love, level. I've always loved that sort of bioorganic aesthetic to tech, you know to um to not replicate but to do the same things that you know technology can right yeah. uh, that's always been a really interesting um I don't, I, I, aesthetic i don't know what you call it i don't know if you call it plant punk so yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's cool and then there's even like a small faction of insect weavers who got kind of cursed or some say they're cursed they think right. blessed 
who can kind of reshape insects into things. Um, and they're nice. sort of a more, they're sort of a uh, disliked publicly, but, uh, you know, they're the sort of the cat outcasts, but they have a very powerful gift. So, um, so that's, you know, that's what you can get in the campaign. It's the full ride. It's what you would hope to get. Right. right? And when it shows up, you will be grateful you did it. Do you know what your reward levels will be yeah. for the, those yeah. three tiers? Like what, what the level is? Yeah. So the digital path is 40 bucks. It's pretty amazing. Two source books in the novel. The Seeker's Path, which is the hardcover of The Seeker's Guide and a print version of the novel, plus the digital versions, is 50 And then it's 115 for The Keeper's Path, which is both source books, the Keeper's Screen, the Dice, and whatever stretch goals we unlock. Everything printed. Yeah, all, everything all in print, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because if you're, you're going to drop – like a, a – a hardback RPG book these days is 50, 60 bucks easy. That's right. So, you know, that's great. Um, well, man, that sounds really good. And, and do you know what your goal is, like your minimum goal is for the Kickstarter? Yes. To make our print run minimum, right, is 35000 And that's what we've got in there right now. So we can cover essentially the setup costs, the preliminary marketing costs, and also to get the right. print run done. Is thirty five thousand, right. so that's our funding goal. And then after that, and we've got that for sure, then we can start unlocking the minis um, and paying for those mold costs, etc. It sounds really cool, man. I'm, you know, I haven't yet, but I'm going to, and I, uh, I'm going to watch these actual plays. You've sent me the links. Uh, you've sent me a, I don't, I don't think a press kit is the right word for it, but I've seen some of the artwork for Asunder, and it looks, it does look very cool. Um, and I'll link in the show notes. People can always go to shameplays.com and I always have show notes for each episode. And I'll have, uh, you know, those actual plays and, Great. and links up there, too. So, and, and folks, don't forget, uh, and this always, get the quick start. Check it out. Take a look. at You can check out the quick start before you, you know, decide what you think. And that's that's always a, a great thing to do. So, would you any 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 final thoughts there before I assault you with the bad joke of the week? No, no, I think that's it. I think it's all been said. You really? Well, thanks for coming on again. I I really enjoy talking with you, and I, I will definitely be keeping an eye on Asunder uh, to see how it does. It, it sounds like a really neat, really neat uh, setting. I got I've got to do it to you, Adam. And once again, I forgot to send you the waiver, so don't sue me. All right. All right. Here we go. Why do paladins wear chainmail? I have no idea. Because it's holy armor. Oh. Ooh, that one stung. That one stung. <laughs> you want a special bonus one? Cuz you're 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 in uh, LA. Let's do it. Right? Let's do it. Yes. You're in LA, so this will I'll, I'll throw this one out for you for being around LA. I just bought a limousine and found out it doesn't come with a driver. I can't believe I spent all that money with nothing to show for it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> all right, man. Well, thanks again for your time. Uh, best best of luck and in, in wind in yourselves with the Sunder RPG. And, and, and thanks yet again for your time. Thanks so much, Shane. Appreciate it, buddy. All right, man. And folks, we will talk to everybody next time on Shane Plays Geek Talk and thanks for listening. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash Shane Plays.